مساكم الله بالخير مشاهدي الكرام حيكم في هذه الحلقه الجديده من برنامج تحت المجهر حلقتنا اليوم علميه وراح تكون استكمال لحلقتنا الاولى اللي استضفنا فيها من تورونتو الدكتور ايزاك بوغوش احد ابرز اللي صنفتهم مجله فوربس الامريكيه كاحد المختصين في مجال ابحاث الكورونا سعينا ايضا ان نكرر اللقاء مع مره ثانيه بناء على يعني طلبات عديده وصلت لنا في البرنامج ان نحتاج ايضا استضافه ثانيه ونطرح مع الدكتور ايزاك مواضيع ثانيه لذلك اليوم ان شاء الله الحلقه راح تكون مع الدكتور ايزاك بوغوش لكن في البدايه خلوني ارحب مجددا بزميلي اللي راح يشاركني في تقديم هذه الحلقه الاستاذ هذا المشارك في كليه الطب بجامعه الكويت الدكتور محمد جمال دكتور محمد مساء الخير مساء النور اخوي ابو العزيز حلقتنا اليوم نقدر نقول انها هي الجزء الثاني ان شاء الله راح تكون اللي نعم. حلقتنا الاولى اللي بديناها مع الدكتور ايزاك بوكوش نعم. اليوم عن شنو راح نركز؟ احنا ودنا اليوم نركز على التعامل السياسي والاجتماعي مع الازمه، الاجراءات الاجتماعيه من تقليل التباعد من زياده التباعد الاجتماعي وما اشبه، تجارب الدول المختلفه مع هذه الامور ونتائجها وانعكاس ذلك على تجربتنا في الكويت، اعتقد راح نستفيد والمشاهدين يستفيدون اذا تحدثنا عن هذا مع الدكتور. ان شاء الله احنا اتصور دقائق على ما يجز الاتصال ان شاء الله مع الدكتور ايزاك خلينا نشوف بشكل سريع جدا هالتقرير. ونرجع ان شاء الله نبدا حلقتنا. Dr. Isaac, good evening. Good evening. We are glad to have you again in this show. Oh, thanks so much for having me back. I really look forward to chatting with you. Thank you. First of all, uh, we would like to discuss with you the different uh, approaches taken by different countries. Uh, in, in particular, we would like to focus on Denmark and South Korea, as they did so well. Uh, could we start with Denmark first? What is the situation there? I mean, uh, Denmark, if you look at Denmark uh, relative to the rest of Europe or other parts of Europe, they've been doing relatively well. And I think the key thing with Denmark is there's nothing uh, fancy. There's nothing uh, unusual. They just took this very seriously from the from the beginning. And they really adhered to uh, physical distancing measures uh, rapidly. And they've applied this consistently. And I think one of the other key approaches here is that there seems to be um, good population buy-in. It just looks like people are adhering to these rules, and then they're sustaining it. And you know, if we look at some of the neighbors around around there, they're they're having a lot more cases. But Denmark seems to have this under much better control than than the others. So you know, no magic, just um, you know, smart policy applied early and adhered to over time, and that seems to work. So. They have about 3,300 cases with about 120 deaths, but they are they seem to be flattening the curve, as you are saying. So, I mean, when would we say that a country did well and a country did not do so well in terms of the uh, uh, numbers? Yeah, I think it's interesting because you know, the numbers only tell uh, some of the story. And we can see places, for example, like uh, South Korea, where early on in the epidemic in South Korea, they just had a massive rise in cases. And it looked like it was going to get out of control very quickly in South Korea. And South Korea was really smart as well. They also, it, you know, they also rapidly implemented some very good changes. And, and they, they really adhered to uh, physical distancing measures. They also harnessed technology quite well. Well, 
uh, to uh, you know identify where hotspots were and to really inform the general public about you know what to do, how to behave, where to go, where not to go. Uh, they they were I mean the first global leader in widespread diagnostic testing and in identifying people who were positive and their close contacts and uh, and ensuring that those individuals were in isolation. And what they were able to do is after they saw this rapid rise in cases, they were really able to quickly flatten their curve. I think the other place that uh, did a remarkable job is Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And in fact, mm -hmm. Taiwan took this very seriously from the beginning. They even sent a delegation over to Wuhan early on to really assess the situation for themselves. And they realized that this was going to be a big problem. So they also started taking it very seriously. And again, we look at Taiwan. It is literally a stone's throw away from mainland China. Uh, there's a ton of interconnectivity between mainland China and Taiwan. And if you look at the numbers in Taiwan, they've done many things right to keep it under control there. So uh, there's a lot of great examples of how to manage this. Uh, Dr. Isaac, uh, you mentioned Denmark and Taiwan. Uh, uh, they took it very serious from, from the beginning. What about the state, the United States now? Uh, 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 the, the numbers getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah, I mean, it's really tragic watching this unfold in the United States. And, you know, it's been pretty clear from the beginning that they have had lots of challenges. Uh, and, uh, you know, sadly, we all knew this was coming, right? We all saw what was happening in China. We were all given about a, maybe about a two month window or so to prepare uh, for this. And, you know, simple things, well, I guess it's not that simple, but really, for example, let's talk about diagnostic testing. Diagnostic testing is one of the pillars of management. It is one of the pillars of ensuring that you have a proper response to this epidemic. And there were bureaucratic hurdles, logistic hurdles, economic hurdles, just lots of barriers, lots of barriers to even get diagnostic testing uh, up and running on, uh, and, and, and scaled in the United States. And I would even say now there's still hurdles to to diagnostic testing in the United States. This is going to be remedied quickly, but but it's, you know, it's April. Uh, and uh, many places were able to do this in February, for example. So I think that was one of the one of the issues. The other issue is that we know um, health care in the United States is pretty fractionated and some people have excellent access to health care and some people have moderate access to health care and some people have no access to health care and there's some some people have tremendous barriers to health care and this is the kind of infection where it doesn't matter who it affects if it affects anybody in your population it's a problem for the entire population so just by virtue of having you know incredible access to health care for uh, some individuals, I mean, that, that doesn't mean they're protected. Everybody really needs to have uh, good access to health care and preventative health in order for the whole population to be safe from this. And I think um, that has been exposed throughout the course of this pandemic, especially in the United States. Uh, Dr. Isaac, here in Kuwait, uh, we acted so early in which we shut the borders on March 14th. Uh, although we had about 100 cases in which all of them were travel related. Uh, now we have about 300 cases, about 15 of them without travel history. Uh, we have a partial lockdown in, in place now. Uh, what advice can you give us uh, and when we can lower restrictions? So, you know, I, I've, I've done a little bit of reading on Kuwait and I'm not going to pretend to be an expert. Uh, you know, Kuwait's done a lot of things right. And I think uh, I think Kuwait certainly uh, did, you know, looks like it may take the path of the more successful countries like the, uh, you know, the Taiwans and the South Koreas and, 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 and the Denmarks, where they took it seriously from the very beginning. Uh, certainly these uh, measures in place that facilitate physical distancing are, are superb, right? Schools have been uh, closed down, mosques have been closed down. Uh, there's support, for example, for uh, elderly individuals to really enable them to stay at home where other people can help them out with uh, basic needs. Uh, there's hand sanitizers, for example, in public places like uh, like grocery stores. There's the curfew in place for 5 p.m. So like these are all excellent strategies and it looks like 
um, it looks like, you know, based on what I can see in the media, it looks like people are adhering to them. So, you know, when we take a step back and we look at, you know, two years from now, we're talking about how countries did and, and how, you know, countries that had a, an easier time and countries that had a rougher time, you know, it looks like uh, Kuwait is on the path to having uh, an, an easier time. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying relative to the rest of the world, it looks like it's having, it's faring a, a little bit better. I don't think it's time to be complacent though. And now is certainly not the time to pat ourselves on the back and say, we're doing a great job because this is where the hard part begins. This is where the hard part begins because now this has to be sustained. And so, it's tough. Me, go ahead. It's tough on an individual level, right? People are having a hard time staying at home. It's very hard to be physically distant from our friends and neighbors. We have to try our best to stay socially connected through the phone and through video chats. Um, so it's tough at the individual. It's also extremely tough on businesses and the economy. And of course, it's not hard to find the tremendous economic toll that this is taking uh, on small businesses, on large businesses. Of course, it's tough on the government as well and, and coordinating these efforts. This takes tremendous resources. And you really need to maintain this message that you need buy-in from your community. So Kuwait's doing, a, a, I think, a remarkable job so far. But you know, as, as tough as it sounds, just like just in Kuwait, just like in the rest of the world, when when these curves have started to get flattened, unfortunately, this is where the hard hard part actually starts because now you have to maintain this. And once you see a sustained reduction in cases, then and only then, then and only then, can you start to really lift some of these restrictions. Uh, ever so slightly, you have to expect to see a rebound in the number of cases and hopefully you can control that rebound in the number of cases. Really, what are we doing here? We're delaying. This is all we're doing. We're just delaying, delaying, delaying. And we're delaying until we get a vaccine that's going to be available. And that's not going to be for 12 to 18 months. Uh, yeah. But of course, you know, we have to be very careful about when they're lifted and to what extent they're lifted. And I don't think anyone's going to say, OK, we're done. We're going to lift all these. What's going to, what you're going to see is when they decide to lift it, they're going to gradually lift some of these restrictions. So maybe they start with the curfew. Maybe they start with in allowing some people to get back to work. You know, this would be a gradual yeah. approach and done in a controlled yeah. manner so that they can still yeah. ensure that they uh, are able to yeah. identify and isolate people in that expected second wave of infections yeah. that will happen uh, if this, if these uh, restrictions are lifted. Now, what is the true case fatalities? We know that in the middle of the epidemic, we cannot come up with a, an accurate case fatality uh, uh, percentage. But according to Dr. Fauci in the um, in his New England Journal article in the end of February, he mentioned a one percent case fatality. We are seeing a variation in the case fatalities between countries. So, for example, in South uh, Korea and Germany, the, the fatalities were very low. So what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll ha let, let's let's just let's book an appointment to chat with each other in two years from now, <laughs> because then I'll be able to look you in the yeah, eye yeah. and tell you at the straight face what yeah. the global case fatality rate is yeah. and what the case fatality rate is for each country. Yeah. But we just don't know. Of yeah. course, there's a range there. There is a range and that range is anywhere from about 0.5 to about 2%, depending on the data you read, depending on the country you're in, depending on the situation of the data being collected. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I think when we have a much better understanding of what is the true number of people that were actually infected with this, yeah. then and only then will we have a better understanding of what the case fatality rate is. Certainly in countries that have done more widespread diagnostic testing, I think we have a more accurate picture of what this is. But even in those countries, there are some limitations because we know that the numbers that are reported are not entirely reflective of the true number of people that were infected with this virus. Uh, and you know, a lot of these calculations are just being done on reported numbers of cases and modeling modeling of the suspected cases um, you know but soon we'll have serologic assays uh, and, and the, a serologic study and what a serologic study does is it answers the question have you ever had this infection yes or no okay it doesn't tell you if you're infected right now it answers the question were you ever infected with this virus yes or no and when we can deploy these tests broadly over a population we can answer the question who truly had this infection and then we can have a much better understanding of 
the proportion of people that died from this infection. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to guess here and prove me wrong, prove me wrong, prove me wrong. But I think at the end of the day, we're going to see a case fatality rate when we consider everything all together. It's probably going to be something in the lines of, you know, maybe about a 0.6 to a 0.8 percent. That's my guess. I could totally be wrong. But, uh, you know, I, I think that it, that would be more reflective of seeing widespread infection that we're just not accounting for, uh, plus the serious cases as well. And, and, you know, let's be clear, that's a high case fatality rate that, you know, people think, oh, it's less than one percent. But that's still a high case fatality rate. That's purely a guess. Uh, and I'm, of course, open to, uh, you know, data coming in. And, and I, I, I obviously I hope that it's much lower than that. But l let's see. Dr. Isaac, China reported that as many as 14% of those who had recovered of uh, coronavirus got reinfected. Can we say that becoming infected does not give the, the kind of immunity? No, I think we have to be pretty cautious interpreting that data. Um, and, you know, obviously it's hard to know what was driving that data. Some, it may be because people were doing repeat testing for, and using this PCR test, which just to ask, which just looks to see if there's a uh, virus there. But remember, virus can be present, but people can have still recovered from the infection because people can be shedding virus for days and days and days after they've recovered from an infection. And sometimes that virus doesn't even grow. It might not even be what we say viable virus. So I'm, I'm a little skeptical of that. And I definitely want to see more data about reinfection. Many of so the short answer is we don't actually have an answer to this, but many people believe and the currently the prevailing thought is that once you've been infected with this virus, you are likely. So once you've been infected with this virus and have recovered from the infection, you are likely to be immune to this infection, at least for the foreseeable future, likely throughout the course of this pandemic. Now, we know that viruses change with time. That's got a word, that word is called mutation. When people hear the word mutation, they get scared. They think it's gonna get worse, it's gonna get uh, more dangerous, but that's not the case. Mutation just means the viruses change with time and all viruses change with time, all viruses mutate. And it doesn't mean that it gets worse and it makes people sicker. But what might happen is that, you know, and again, I have to preface this with, we don't know, this is just the prevailing theory right now. Someone gets infected with, this, with COVID-19, they recover from the infection, they will likely mount an immune response and likely be uh, not able to get infected with this for the foreseeable future. And of course, at some point in the future, you know, after the course of this pandemic, the virus might change to uh, you know a, a, a little bit and be slightly different from the one that infected them, uh, or their immunity might go down with a, with a little bit of time, and and maybe people are prone to getting reinfected, you know, a year later or something like that. This is again purely um, uh, theoretical, but this is this is the uh, this is the prevailing theory now. Of course, we're all open to data. We're all open to changing our opinions, but uh, you know, currently that seems to be the the scientific consensus. Now, uh, just uh, coming to the last question, do you have any um, updates uh, from research that you think is important to share with the public? Yeah, yeah, there, there are some, uh, some pretty, pretty helpful updates. And, and, you know, a lot of the research updates are still unanswered, but gives us a lot of hope. I'm very excited about the global coordination in, in uh, looking for treatments and prevention strategies for this infection. So right now, across the world, there are at least five different drugs that are being tested currently in clinical trials to see if this can really help people infected with this virus recover quicker. And the beautiful thing is that this isn't just one hospital or two hospitals doing it. There really is a global coordinated strategy so we can recruit large numbers of people and answer these questions. Uh, so I think in the coming months, we're going to have much better answers as to, you know, what drugs can we use to treat this infection? The other thing I'm actually very excited about is what's called prophylaxis studies. And there's many studies underway that are looking at the question, if I'm exposed to the virus, can I take a drug, can I take a pill that will actually prevent me from getting sick with this infection as well? And I mean, this would be extremely helpful. For, so if we can even prevent people from getting this infection, that would be very helpful as well. So those trials 
are underway too. And what I'm is, very excited what about is them used because for I think we should start to see early data and evidence in the next you know, six to eight weeks because they are actively recruiting patients globally. Well, that's good to hear that uh, we will get something in six to eight weeks. But what are they using for prophylaxis? What is promising in terms of prophylaxis? Well, so I have to be very cautious because we don't have any data yet, but there's many different drugs that are being trialed. One of the ones that people might be aware of is chloroquine and or its related drug hydroxychloroquine is one. Another drug is an antiviral drug. It's called lopinavir and ritonavir. So it's two antiviral drugs mixed together as one. Those are just two examples of drugs that are being used in the prophylaxis studies. Uh, Dr. Isaac, uh, my last question, although I know that you don't have a clear answer for that, but how long do you think we will live under the threat of this virus? Oh my God, I wish I had an answer to that. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, in short, I think that countries that are, 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 are really controlling this uh, well, like Kuwait, for example, may start to see um, a gradual lift in these public health restrictions. But I truly don't think we're going to see a return to normal life as we know it until there is the wide scale implementation of an effective vaccine. And I really think that that's a minimum of a year away. Um, but then and only then can we be confident that this virus is not going to come back and really impact our countries and our populations. Well, unfortunately, uh, a year it's going to be too long. Uh... Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, Dr. Isaac uh, Bogosh from uh, from Toronto. We really enjoy talking to you. Uh, thank you and stay safe. Love love chatting with you guys as well. Have a great day and again stay safe and best of luck to you. Thank you. You too. You too. يعني أنا كنت شوية متفائل في في بداية اللقاء خصوصاً لما نتكلم عن الإجراءات الاحترازية المبكرة اللي صارت يمكن في تايوان اللي ذكرها وفي الدنمارك وتكلم أيضاً عن الكويت وتكلم عن سنغافورة بس في آخر لقاء لما قال أن الحياة ما راح ترجع طبيعية حسب تقديره الأولي إلا بعد سنة يعني خلى خلاني شوية يعني أنا أعتقد هو قصدة ترجع طبيعية مئة بالمئة بس في شيء يدعو للتفاؤل قال اللي هو قال خلال ست إلى ثمان أسابيع راح نلقى نتائج مو بس في العلاج هذه أول مرة باللقاء نتكلم عن البروفيلاكسس وهو منع حدوث المرض بمعنى إذا شخص معرض إنه يصير فيه المرض مثلا طلع بالشارع وراح مكان مزدحم مثلا وخذ هل في دواء ياخذ الشخص بحيث إن ما يصاب أساسا بالفيروس بعد ما زادت احتمالية إصابته فيبدو أن هناك دراسات الآن على الوقاية ومثل ما قال خلال ستة ثمان أسابيع راح نوصل إلى بعض النتائج من الناحية إذا وصلنا حق نتائج أبحاث خلال شهر شهرين على العلاجات علاج فعال وقوي مثبت بحثيا ووصلنا إلى نتيجة ممتازة في بحث يبين الوقايه ووجود ادويه للوقايه، هني راح اعتقد راح تتغير قواعد معركتنا مع الكورونا خلال انتظارنا الى التطعيم، طبعا الـ 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 الاساس هو انتظار التطعيم وهو الشيء اللي راح يحدث النقله النوعيه في المعركه، ولكن وجود علاج فعال ومثبت ووجود دواء وقائي فعال ومثبت هذا ايضا راح يكونون يعني امور على الاقل في تقليل جدا جدا حده انتشار هذا جداً الوباء جداً يعني ان شاء الله اليوم نكون احنا هم يعني قدمنا جرعه علميه في لقائنا نعم. مع الدكتور ايزاك للساده المشاهدين والشيء الجميل الثاني ان اجراءاتنا في الكويت نفس ما ذكرها وتبحر فيها قليلا يبدو انها اجراءات ممتازه تضاهي افضل الدول بحيث انه راح نوصل ان شاء الله الى مرحله ممتازه فهذا دعوه حق المشاهدين ان يلتزمون بهذه الاجراءات صح هي متعبة ولكن قاعد تعطي نتيجة الآن وستعطي نتيجة في المستقبل واللي يمكن طبقناه في الكويت يعني. يمكن حتى ضاهينا فيها الإجراءات اللي تم اتخاذها يمكن في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية لأنهم تأخروا نعم أفضل من ما أخذوا نعم. الموضوع بشكل نعم. جدي في البدايات نعم. والحين يمكن عشان كذا قاعدين نشوف الأرقام قاعدة تتزايد بشكل كبير وكبير صحيح آه. ومشكلة الولايات المتحدة العظمى نفس ما ذكرها الأكسس تو كير قدرة الدخول على المستشفى النظام الصحي هم النظام الصحي مو اي واحد يقدر يروح اي مكان مو نفسنا احنا الكويت تغطي كل الموجودين خطاب صاحب السمو ذكر انه وجه مجلس الوزراء لرعاية المواطن والوافد والزائر كل من على الكويت مغطى في النظام الصحي ويعالج يعالج اذا مرض بس اهم شيء حتى نعاون الجهات الرسمية في الدولة نعم. 
ونعبر ان شاء الله بر الامان هذا هذا الوباء نلتزم مره ثانيه نعم. للجلوس في المنزل استاذ المشارك في كليه الطب دكتور محمد جمال كل شكر لك شكرا ابو عبد العزيز شكرا موصول لكم مشاهدينا الكرام ناكد على الكلام اللي في كل لقاء قاعدين نقوله واليوم ايضا اكد ضيفنا من كندا ان الاجراءات اللي قاعد تقوم فيها الدوله بالكويت اجراءات جدا جيده وجدا متقدمه لكن هذا ما يمنع ان ايضا نستمر في التزامنا بتعليمات وزاره الصحه وان نقعد في البيت اكثر جلوسنا في البيت اكثر راح يقلل فترة عبورنا إن شاء الله في هذه الأزمة بشكل أسرع نحتاج نقعد في البيت أكثر ونلتزم تعليمات وزارة الصحة الله يحفظكم من كل شر إن شاء الله نشوفكم على خير في أمان الله